Okay, so um, I want to share with you the very first law, which is found in the book of Jewish law. Let's do that. So there's a book of Jewish law called the book of Jewish law. And in Hebrew, it's called anyone? Torah is a good one. That is true. That is true. That's where the source of it all is. But we have certain laws. I love those. I love them. Coming from the right? The Shulchan Aruch. These people are pioneering as well, right? What is a Shulchan Aruch? Shulchan Aruch literally means a set table. Just a quick background of all this. And I, I love to do it, but it usually ends up taking up the whole time. And then I'm going to get the point. So I'm going to rip through this quickly. There was a fellow by the name of Yosef Cairo. Yosef Cairo lived in the 1500s. And he came along and he found that there was a bit of a problem. If you wanted to know what to do with your life in terms of Judaism, in terms of Torah, then the way, which is everything, then what would you do? You would open up a Torah, right? Known as the Bible, five books of Moses. Now you could also learn Nach, the Vimic Sum, the prophets and the writings. However, they wouldn't give you Jewish law, generally speaking. Very few cases, if any, that actually be Jewish law. Jewish law comes from the T of Tanakh. Those who aren't familiar with Tanakh, Tanakh is an acronym for Torah, Nevim, and Ksuvim. If you can't say ch, so then it's just Tanakh. <laughs> so anyway, they put an H at the end for some reason. Anyway, but we have the following day, the Torah part. You open up and start learning. Let's learn some Torah. After you learn Torah, then what do you do? You start learning the Mishnah. What's Mishnah? Mishnah is Torah. What part of Torah? The oral Torah. All right, because we understand that in Sinai, we got two things. We're in Torah and the Oath. Well, I don't believe it. Okay, then, don't believe it. I don't believe that uh, other things. In any event, the idea is what we have is that this is what Judaism uh, states in any event, that we have what's called the written Torah and the oral Torah. Both of them were given at Sinai. It wasn't something which we had, Torah, the written Torah, and then the oral Torah came afterwards and the rabbis decided to add things in. <laughs> no, it all happened at the same time. The Lord gave Moses the written and oral Torah. How do you know? Great question. Not for today. I'm going to take this as a prerequisite that you all know. All right, now everybody, please, if you'll look at the light, let's begin. Okay, here we go. So let's start over. Uh, no, so yeah, the following idea. Now this idea of the written and the oral Torah. Now that's what you would do if you want to know what to do. You'd start learning. You'd study. Obviously, you'd have hopefully someone who had already studied and learned to be able to help along. But as we continue in our lives, that's how we know what to do. However, people are getting lazy. People were getting lazy, they weren't having the ability anymore of doing such things, so therefore came along and here's the Cairo, he said, I want to write a book. I want to write a book to help people out. I'm going to call this book the Shulchan Aruch. I don't know what does the Shulchan Aruch mean? What does it literally mean? The set table. The set table. I'm going to give them a set table that they can just come and eat. You don't have to go and set the table yourself and try to figure it out. You can just do the laws, right? I don't know what to do. So what do you do? Open up a book which has. Maybe it's all codified. It's all straight up there, right? So he wrote that. He was a Faradik. It was someone else by the name of Moshe Issa, this acronym known as the Ramah, who around the same time decided he's going to write a book as well. Then he found out about the, the Mechaber's books. Did you really want me to start quickly from the beginning? Okay, there's a book called the Shulchan Aruch, the book of Jewish law. The book of Jewish law is based off Jewish law. Yeah, now, where it comes from is essentially the Talmud, based off the Mishnah. Mishnah and the Talmud, which is the oral Torah, expounding, elaborating, elucidating, making clear that which the written Torah actually means. There are plenty of things that are written in the written Torah that by itself don't really make much sense. Other things that you wouldn't know at all together. One classic example is we all know something called tefillin, phylacteries. So we all know if you look in the Torah, it tells you what phylacteries are and it tells you how to make them. But the reality is it doesn't. Nowhere in the Torah does it tell you. All it says is, So if anyone knows what a totafos is, please get back to me and let me know. Answer is, come along the oral Torah, which teaches us what that is, etc. One example of many. The idea, nonetheless, is, it became, we have the written and the oral, and people used to just learn those things to know things. Eventually, people started to lose that, so therefore came along the Rabbi Yosef Karo, the 1500s, he wrote the Shulchan Aruch, the set table. Came along Garamah at the same time, he says, hey, I'll do a book also. Then he found out about that book, which was already written, so he said, instead of writing a whole new book, what he decided was, he's going to comment on that previous book. And he called his commentary, anyone know? Anyone at all know? Everyone in the room is in play. I don't care if you're a second or religious, better answer this question. What's that book called? The Mapa. The Mapa. What does Mapa mean? Mapa means tablecloth. He said, oh, I have the set table, so I'll just put a tablecloth. Right? In other words, I'll just add to it. Now, I never understood that, because if you have a set table, put a table on the top of it, it kind of messes everything up. But you get the idea, right? He had the set table, let me just add to it instead of doing it. And they were originally meant as notes. Oh, how do you say note? Haga. Eventually, they added the notes to the book itself, and that's why it became, if you look in the Shulchan Aruch, you will see a commentary, and then you'll see the word Haga, which means note, and they added it together. Now, when a person says Shulchan Aruch, generally they mean the old King Gaboodle of the Mechaber and the Ramah. 
The Mechaber, the author, known as Rabbi Yosef Kairi, was Sephardic in descent, and therefore is writing for Sephardim, as well as Ashkenazim, as long as the Ramah doesn't argue. If the Ramah comes and says a commentary, then that means he's saying, I disagree, or I want to add to this. That's a quick synopsis. Yeah? Does the oral law not explain? I don't know what the oral law is. The oral it, law is was given in conjunction with the written law. So it doesn't explain. It certainly does elaborate, elucidate, and make clear what the written law means. However, it would take some time to sit down and learn through the entirety of understanding of what it is. And you got know what to do today. So when you wake up in the morning, you're like, okay, what do I do now? Hold on, let me study a book for six months. Right? Okay, uh, what did I do now? Then you realize, what? Messed up six months ago, right? So that's why you have rabbis and different people that have learned through this already, and the, the public figures of learning and teaching it, etc. And there's a certain level of trust at that level, and then you continue learning, and then you get it yourself. Everybody gets this? Makes sense? Ideally, yeah. Was the Mishnah Torah from Rambam a sort of different purpose than Hamul? Mishnah Torah from the Rambam served a tremendous purpose here. When Rav when Rav Yosef Cairo, blessed memory, the one who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, wrote his book, he based it off three main commentaries: the Rush, the Riff. The Rambam. Right, so I use these three commentaries on the Talmud right, to do such a thing. The Rambam, when he codifies Jewish law, it's not generally people don't use his as the book. There are some, there are some Taimanim, right, those from Taiman that would go ahead and actually follow Jewish law straight from the Rambam itself. But generally, it's not where we go. It's been accepted in the Shulchan Aruch and breaking down nowadays to what's known as the Mishnah Berurah. Mishnah Berurah was a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch and Ramah written by none other than the Chavetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael Meir HaKohen Kingen, who lived from 1839 to 1933. It was a great, great sage. And he writes in his commentary, which basically breaks down, elaborates, and makes clear that. So what I want to get into is just a very first statement. Now, I wanted to just share with you something which I didn't know. My brother shared this with me. I didn't know until he shared it. I didn't believe him until my brother-in-law told me. Now I think they're in cahoots. I don't know. <laughs> However, the Shulchan Aruch that was written was meant to be written in a way that you could study its entirety every month. Was to study the entire Shulchan Aruch every single month. Now that's that's quite a, that's quite a task. It's quite a task. Yeah, I do say that very famously that 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 Moshe here. He did say quite quite famously that Moshe Feinstein used to study the entire Shulchan Aruch every month. He used to do their eight day. Right, studying one of the commentaries, all the commentary. But in any event, let's get to what we're saying. This is background. Is this somewhat clear to everyone? Does this make sense a little bit? Yeah. Are you with me, Simcha? Yeah, you, with, you got what I just said? Even if I'm lying, but at least you heard what I said. Okay, good. Yeah, now let's get into truth. All the I just said? No, I'm just kidding. That's right. That would be bad. I totally messed with your heads. Okay, so now we get comes along the very first commentary. Now, this is a book of Jewish law, don't forget. Well, I ask you, if you were to open up any book of law from any part of the world, what would you expect after the introduction? What would you expect, <clears throat> number one, to say? What? Whatever the first law is. Whatever the first law is, right? That's what I was looking for. Whatever is the first law. This is the book of law. Let's talk law. What's the first law that we have in the Shulchan Aruch? Says the Mechaber, Yisgaber Ka'ari, Olamud Baboger, La'avodos Baro, Shemi Yem, Or Ashach. You should strengthen yourself like a lion. For Thalese Komendeleon. <laughs> Strengthen yourself like a lion. What did you say in Arabic? <sighs> Strengthen yourself like a lion to get up early in the morning to serve your Creator. <laughs> that you should awaken the morning. Sheheim or Hashachar. You should awaken the morning. Not the morning should awaken you. You should awaken the morning. What does that mean? You should awaken the morning? Wake up before at least sunrise, right? Oh, sunrise. At least sunrise, maybe even dawn, right? <laughs> even dawn. Okay, kill me here, okay? You know, I was already something to do like much earlier, but okay, good. Along the same line, it is at least get up before sunrise, right? Which is a very famous idea called dates. Nates hachama literally means the rising of the sun. I prayed nates. What does that mean? You prayed nates. It's not some sort of idolatry. Praying nates means that you pray at the rising of the sun. And ideally, it's what's supposed to be done. We're supposed to hit the Amidah, the Shemona Esrei, the 18, which is really 19. We're supposed to hit that when the sun is popping out. Which we can start praying even before that. That's ideal, people. We should be Ma'or HaShachar. We should be awakening in the morning. The morning is not awakening us. We've got to get on up and start awakening in the morning. But listen to what it says. 
Yisgaber ka'ari, strengthen yourself like a lion. You should strengthen yourself like a lion to get up early in the morning. Yo, tengo una pregunta. Let me ask you something. <laughs> if you were to go ahead, you want to use an animal to go ahead and say, would you have used a lion? You think about it, how do lions wake up? Yeah, they're like, Rrr. They're like, yeah, but they're like chillers. Lions are a bunch of chillers, yeah? Is that what you want to tell someone? You want to, I want you to get up, son. When you wake up in the morning, I want you to wake up like a lion. Okay. <laughs> It's like this slow awakening. They just like whatever. Okay, we're gonna see how maybe this works. First of all, where is the Shulchan Aruch getting this commentary from? He's actually coming from somebody I didn't mention before. I apologize, but from someone before him known as the Torah. The Torah is quoting a Mishnah. The Mishnah is found in Pirkei Avos. The Mishnah in Pirkei Avos says, "Heviyaz kanamer v'kal kanesher rots katzvi v'gibor v'gibor." Anyone? Know no. that song? Just me? Yeah, okay. Cool. <laughs> do, do you like it? Yeah. Do, do you know it? No, you guys don't know that song? Okay. Anyway, so uh, is he so I think he's so little really good song, I think. I had a friend of mine, Jesse Sachs, sang the high part. <laughs> but the Mishnah says, have the odds kind of mare? What is a no mare? Anyone know? <coughs> Close. And you may even be right, according to the Marshan Kiddushin, by the way. But generally, a Namer, at least in modern year as well, means a leopard. A leopard. Have a Uz Kanamer. You should be Uz Kanamer. What's, I don't know, if, can, can you, is anyone, this is hieroglyphics. <laughs> yeah? How about if I do it like this? If I do it, is this more, I don't know if I'm able to do this, but I think I will. Like, like that. Is that, is, oh. it, is that better? A little bit better? Okay, I'll do it. We'll try like that. Okay? This is says, be Oz Kanamer. A person should be Oz like a Namer. What does Oz mean? Oz means bold. Right? Or it can be Oz just means like brazen. Right? That's, that's a word. Say again? Bold? Bold. No, no, no. Bold. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be bold yeah. like a Namer. Yeah? So. Right, so it's about to be bold like an Amer. Be bold like an Amer. What's an Amer? So he said, a leopard. I'm not even going to attempt to spell that. Okay, you are waiting, yeah? Okay, so bold like a leopard. Have you asked Amer? The Kal Kanesher. Kal means? Light. Light. I'm going to give another word for it also. Swift. <laughs> Something is light. Let's say, but we don't go with light, either way. The Kal Kanesher. What's a Nesher? Well, tell me the the thing that brought you from the airport. What's that? What'd you say? Say it. A gun. That's a neshek. Oh. Right? Someone says, yesh neshek, right? It's a weapon. Right? But what is a nesher? An eagle. An eagle. So we have what? Eagle. Now, here we go. The kal kanesher. The kal kanesher. Rot. Which means to run. Katsvi. What's it to be? A deer. Drop everything and read. Everybody had that program in school? <laughs> I know it's too easy. I got it. Yeah, but we had a deer. Drop everything and read. Now it's drop everything and watch movies. But and that's what it is, right? What's that? Sweet. Fit. Gibor. Gibors are not my strong point. So is that is that a gibor? The gibor. Is there a yud in gibor? Yeah. The gibor. The gibor, which means strength, strong, hazak, much of the same, I don't know. Strong, brain. Oh, that's interesting you said that. Like a lion. Okay, so the Mishnah says, Have the Oz Kanamer, the Kal Kanesh, Rotz Katsvi, the Gibor Kari, Lasso, Switzon, Avicha, Shabashalem. To do the will of your Father in heaven. Okay, make sense? Does the idea make sense? I didn't say anything crazy. To do the will of Father in heaven, we need to do it this way. One should be bold as a leopard, be swift as an eagle, be fast as a deer, run like a deer, and be strong as a lion to fulfill the word of the Lord. Ah. It is a high demand. It's quite a high demand, actually. It's probably good advice. From both directions. One is, in other words, if you're doing it the right way, the other is in order to do it the right way. If that made sense. Okay, now, 
The question is asked, why are you saying, be bold, light, run, strong, like a leopard, a eagle, a deer, and a lion? Why not just say, be bold, swift, run, and strong to do the will of your Father in heaven? We have adjectives and then we have nouns. Why do we need the nouns? Just use the adjectives. <coughs> or verbs, right? Some of them. Or just use the noun. Okay. Just use the noun. Or just use the noun. You, you should, well, I don't know what you would do for a noun. You'd, be, you'd say, serve God like a leopard. Well, what would you do? <laughs> I don't know what that, it could, it could be. And, and you know what? Bottom, it may be your right. But the confusion might be the answer. Right? And let's see. So I don't have a suggestion is why it says that. Okay, again, you used this one yesterday, but it's a good answer again. Yeah, what do you got? I don't know, maybe taking the animal, um, the animal level and elevating it. Okay, beautiful. I like it. I like it a lot. And it's true that that's what Judaism is about. It's about elevating. I'm looking for something different. You observe their behavior at some level. Good. Example, <coughs> animal behavior. If, okay, but I could adopt just bold, light, run, strong. I don't need to adopt them. Example of what? Example of what it is to yeah. see it clear and understand. Right. Let's bring all these together. Comes naturally. Good. Which you can it is what it is. It is what it is. A lion is never like, you know, today I'm not going to be bold. Oh, today I'm, fe I'm, I mean, I mean a leopard, right? A, a lion never says, today I think I'm not going to be mighty. You know, it, it, the lions just can't wait to be king. They, they want it. You understand? That's, that's their essence. That's what they are. So, you, therefore, the mission is telling us, yeah, sure, you can be bold, but what is a number? What is a leopard? A leopard is brazen. That's what it is. And they saying, make it that it is. Well, that's what you are. A deer runs. Deers don't say, today I will trot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, deers run. You get it? Lions are mighty. But it's, oh, now, you should know. I'll tell you. You've been to South Africa before, right? And they've lived there a couple years. You as well. Has anyone ever been to South Africa before? The rest of you? Okay. So, South Africa, when I went to visit, and I was taken to a lion and rhino park. Uh, for you guys, it would be like a little petting zoo, because it was like, you know, someone's backyard, yeah? But it wasn't like Kruger or whatever it is. Thank God, he's in three days without seeing anything. But the idea is, it was like this little thing. For me, it was crazy. Like, they have signs all over the place, like, you know, open your window at your own risk of death. You know, it's like, it's, quite, it's not like you go to a safari and like um, Action Park or Great Adventure, you know what these things are. And they have like, what do they have? Monkeys jumping over it. It's like, ah, oh, they say don't feed it. Everyone's feeding them or whatever. Okay, what are they going to do? It's like, well, I guess they could kill you, but, but they probably won't. Yeah, they have like little things going, ostriches or whatever. You know, an ostrich actually is pretty wild. Yeah, uh, exactly. you know, <laughs> when I was in the Lion and Rider Park, I was with Jack from the Shul. You know Jack? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and this guy, Jack, he took me there. and. We, I had to use the uh, facilities. So we went, there was this guy feeding an ostrich. Yeah, this, this guy who he's, he hangs out there all day, right? And you know, he would feed the ostrich from his hand. And he's like, he says to me, Oh, my God. I said, what? He said, oh, uh, do you want to feed the animal? Do you want to feed the ostrich? I'm like, what do you do? He's like, just hold it in your hand like this, right? <laughs> Let me see you do it first. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So he does. He puts it in the ostrich. They come, they go, they're like, <laughs> right? And the guy, they ate half his hand. So I was like, he's like, now your turn. No, you're right. <laughs> but they're like eating from his hand. His hand was all calloused. You can see. It's all calloused. Like, you know, guitarist gets a finger thing. He had all these things. Whoosh, yeah. Okay. I was like, I don't think I have to use the bathroom anymore. Let's get in the car. Right? Like this rhinoceros coming out of you. It's like, they're literally right outside the car. There are people that there are, in particular, I know there's a lot of Chinese that come to visit, and they go to these parts, and they, they're you know, enamored with animals, they get out of their car, take pictures. Mm, and they get eaten up. And they're mad, I'm not Chinese for them. Right, so what happens? They go ahead, and they literally take out, this is one guy, he got out of his car, and it's like, oh, I'm going to go, which means, <laughs> the lion's sleeping. You guys don't speak to it. And the lion's sleeping, right? So he goes ahead, he sees the lion sleeping, and um, he gets out of his car. Big mistake. A lion goes from zero to sixty faster than a Porsche. You understand? They, they base it off the line. You get it? 
And they go, bam! Now, this guy, thank God, what happened to him, for him at least, thank God, is he got so scared when he saw the lion jump that he fell backwards into his car. He fell into his car, and then they shut the door. And the lion pounced on him, whatever, but he survived. Other people get eaten by these lions. Yeah? That's what they call it. They're mighty, they're powerful. <coughs> Says the first book of Jewish law, the very first thing is Yisgaber Ka'ari, or like, not you, David, I know, the singer Chaim David. Avodaz Boro, come on, David. I tell you, it is what? Strengthen yourself in the line. What? That's what you've got to become. It's got to be part of you. To do what? Listen to this. This is the kick now. Avodaz Boro, to serve your Creator. Strengthen yourself in the morning to serve your Creator. We discussed this once, I think, a couple of days ago, about boredom. Have you ever been bored? You're bored, right? It's bored. What do you do? Right? When we talked about the idea of, do you want rules? Yesterday. Yeah, without any rules, be bored. What do I do now? Yeah, you want rules, you want to break them. Right? That was yesterday. But the idea is, what, have you ever been bored? Think about it, like, unless you have what to do, you're bored. We all want what to do. <laughs> right away, what are you supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be serving the creative world. Now, ultimately, it'll be for your own good, it's for your own pleasure, it's for your own benefit, and all that jazz. It's all true. But the reality is, this is our job. We are, people don't like to hear this, and we should probably beat around the bush and sugarcoat this a little. Everything's great, and that's love loves you. <laughs> you know? But we're slaves. We are abundant. And you know what? It's not a bad thing, it's awesome. To be a slave is awesome. Because the reality is you have two choices. You're either a slave to someone or a slave to yourself. Do you understand that idea? Yeah. It is. What? 1984. Okay, big brother. Yeah. It's after 2014 though. But the idea is, is that you are a slave no matter what, you are a slave. Sounds like it because that's what it is. What do I mean by that? There was a, used to be someone who taught here in Asia Thora of Hill of Wonder. And he was once uh, speaking somewhere, and some secular fellow came over to him and says to him, <laughs> Look at you. You're stuck. Says this secular fellow to this rabbi. He's got the whole monkey suit, the big beard, and all that, <coughs> the boing boings, right? He says to him, You know, you're stuck. You can't smoke on Shabbos. On Shabbos, for those, it's called Shabbat, St. Holly. You can't smoke on Shabbos. So you see, you are not in control of your life. I'm in control of my life. So Reb Noach, I'm sorry, Reb Hillel responded to him and said, first off, I don't smoke. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what day it is, I ain't smoking. Right? Second of all, it's not that I can't smoke on Shabbos. It's that you can't not smoke on Shabbos. For those who didn't catch the double negative, mm -hmm. you have to smoke the chalice. I... You don't have a choice. Everybody get what just happened? The reality is, every one of us is a slave. The question is whether you're a slave to a higher authority or to yourself. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Some of us think we're God. Only I am. But the reality is, if you're just living a life that you think you're God, that's a pretty miserable life. You know why? Because then when things don't go right, you messed up. <laughs> but if this God, don't worry, you didn't mess up. God messed up. <laughs> Did everybody get it? So it comes down to, the question is, when we're coming along, who do you want to be a slave to? But we're slaves. Let's get this straight. The reality is we are above We are slaves. And like we said, there was, a, there was once a, you know, a, uh, a fellow, a, a Jew, who became religious, he became observant, he became from, he became orthodox, whichever word you want to say, what's your name? And he grew up secular, he's got the whole long hair thing going, and whatever it is. And then, when he became observant, he did what a lot of people do sometimes, is he cut all of his hair, except for his pace. He kept the boy once. And when he came to the airport, he handed his passport in. The only problem is his passport had his old self. And this had his, him was him, him. So the person's looking at the passport, looks at him, 
And so he's trying to figure out like, what's going on. And then he realizes, oh, oh, get it. And the woman turns to him and says, the secular woman says, ah, mom, I the chavshi. So in Hebrew means, once you were free. It's an expression for a secular. You're free. When you're secular, you're free. You do whatever you want, right? And he responded, no. Achshav, ani chavshi. Ahora, yo es frío. Now I'm cold. But really, I would say, right? Now I'm free. Everybody get that? You think you're free, you can do whatever you want. Living a life of secularism is awesome. Because <laughs> you can you don't have to keep Shabbos or kosher. You don't have to have any rules. Isn't it great having no rules and not knowing what to do with life? <clears throat> no, it's great having rules. It's great having direction. And then you'll decide whether you want to keep it or not. It's great having direction. Ultimately, my friends, the mission starts, I'm sorry, the Allah starts with this. The big one is a focus. It's like those movies, every movie, right, when it's like a business-related movie. What I mean is that there's someone involved in a business who was working somewhere and they were making their way, whatever it is, it starts the following. You know, there's like music in the background and you see a pan in a room, like someone's room, someone's bedroom, and you're like, eh, 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 and it zooms in like on the clock, you know what I'm talking about? And then eh, you see a hand come out and shut it, and then the hand and it goes to the person, you see the you know, doing the thing, and like brushing their teeth and getting ready and putting on their tie and going on the subway, holding their, 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 their coffee. Focus, right? Why do you wake up in the morning? For something to do. What? Their job. Their job. Their job. Their work. They woke up to go to work. <coughs> Is that right? They woke up to go to work. They had, a, they had a purpose and a goal and a mission. I woke up to go to work. What's it saying here? Exactly the same thing. Get up to go to work. We gotta serve our creative. Let's get to work. But unfortunately, what happens when we have a day off? Like, oh, uh, uh, what about what about what about prayer? What about learning? What about growth? Poof. Yeah? The idea is we got to go into work. And we should be more of the shah. Now what type of work should you be involved with? What should you be focusing on? This, my friends, comes to one of the, I mean, it's not the key, but it's a key to the key. We'll get to the key. If we get to it, if we don't, then we won't. If we do, then we won't. And the key is like this. When Moshe Chaim was a great, great sage, so from 1707 to 1746 in Padua, Italy, wrote many books. One of the most famous ones is called the Mesilas Hashem, the Path of the Just. In the beginning of the Path of the Just, he starts off by saying, Yisoda chasidus hashor sha'avoda she'izmar ve'izamit Eitzel ko'ad the macho vaso ba'olamo For those who don't speak Hebrew, I just said, again, I will not translate. <laughs> and he says, the root and the foundation of saintliness and our purpose and our existence and what we're doing here is uh, to find out with clarity and with truth what the heck are we doing here? What are we doing here? We're alive. We're here. Why are we here? What are we doing you ever go through a day, and at the end of the day, you look back and you say, what did I do today? What did I do? Now, there's two different types of what did I do. One what did I do is a what I do of, you know, I, um, let's say a person says, um, I didn't have any goal at all. And I look back and what did I do? I didn't do anything. I just wasted my day. Another what did I do is a person who has a job and has a career and has a focus. But after years of doing it, they go, why am I doing this job? Right? Do we see the two different types of what I do? So the first one is probably worse than the second one. right? Not that we're distracted at all. But the second one is, is the idea of where at least I'm doing something with my life. Yeah? I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a garbage man. I'm a businessman. I'm a teacher. I'm a, a student. I'm whatever. I'm doing something. But why am I doing that? Uh, maybe I should be doing something else. But at least you're doing something. The other one is I'm not doing anything. Right? That's called Sundays, right? In America. Right? Yeah? In Israel, there's no such thing as Sundays, some of you have learned. Right? That's one of the biggest traumatic experiences moving to Israel. There's no Sunday. Right? That's why it's like any other day. And like, you wake up, you're like, what day is it? I don't know. We base our life off Sunday, you know? It's like, oh, yesterday was a barbecue. Oh, today's Monday, you know? Here it's like, oh, yesterday was Shabbos. Today's Sunday. Is it Monday? What, is it Tuesday? What day is it, right? <laughs> we don't even know. But that's what happens. At the end of a Sunday, you're like, what did I do? That, oh, I was supposed to do, ah. Oh. What happened with our life? Do we have a focus of where we're heading and what we're supposed to be doing? Yesod the Hasidus v'shoresh avoda people. 
sometimes we, we think we're having a good time and we fooled, you know, we fooled everyone because we got away with doing nothing, you know? It's like when the teacher asks, are you with me, right? You know, are you with me? You're like, yes, hoping they're not going to ask, you know, okay, so read, yeah? Read the next word in the science book on page 725, right? You're like, uh-uh. So they go, are you with me? You're like, you're like yes. And, and then afterwards, it's just like, oh, okay, and then move on. You're like, I got them. I fooled them. They thought I was with them. <laughs> Little did they know I'm going to fail this test. <laughs> I really showed them. <laughs> or are you going to fail the test now? Do you get it? Who'd you show? Who did we show that we fooled everyone, that we got away living our life without having to have any, any plan? Wake up one day and what do we do? What are we doing? What do we do now? It's a seventh inning stretch at any baseball game. It's the most depressing song that comes on. Where'd you come from? Where'd you go? Where'd you come from? I'm not Joe. Where did you come from? Where did you go? Where did you come from? God. That was like something stretchy, like, oh my gosh, what a depressing. I don't know where I came from. I don't know where I'm going. Play ball! Thank God, I need something to do. Yeah? <laughs> What's our focus? Now, let's say you figure it out what it is. You figure out what your goal and your focus and what you're supposed to do with your life. What should you then do? Do it. 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 Right? It. Right? Nike, Nike, you got it right. Just do it. You gotta be careful because you don't have to tie your woods. But. But you understand the idea is, is that he was a spokesman. <laughs> what we have over here is that what? Just do it. Figure out what your purpose is and then do it. How much should you give towards it? How much? 100%. 100%. All the time. All news, all the time. Da, 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 you give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. Which, technically speaking, is not all news all the time. It's in 22 minutes. Did you get that yet? And that's what I want. You've got to be giving everything all of the time. I like to think of Michael Phelps. Anyone knows what Michael Phelps is? Right, very good. Michael Phelps, Olympic gold medalist. I think he's won the most in the history, about four billion. And uh, it's really not fair because the guy's like six twelve. He wins the race before he walks in the water. Right? But the idea is what, nonetheless, he's worked on himself. Just a little known fact on Michael Phelps. I mean, you know how, many, how much he eats a day? How much does Michael Phelps eat a day? What? Ten thousand calories? Oh, I read twelve. But anyway, the idea is what he eats about twelve thousand calories a day. Mm -hmm. For those unfamiliar, uh, you're supposed to average, you're supposed to eat around 2,000, that's a little bit high even, right? But nowadays, because everyone wants to be nothing. But then as well, let's say a healthy diet of 2,000 calories a day, getting your veggies in there as well, your greens and all your, you know, you get your, so everything you need. But that's about 2,000, he's eating six days in, with, in one day. He has his meals, like a pizza, his, his, his metabolism is working about a million times an hour, right? Okay, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. The food fat, yeah? And most cases, since it moves so fast, he's got it. How much time is he in the pool? He's in the pool, I think, eight hours a day. What's he doing when he's not in the pool? Thinking about the pool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> his friend comes to say, hey, man, want to go, go get some drinks? He's like, no, no, I don't drink. We know he smokes, though. You know, all history. But then his wife goes, no, I don't drink. It was in high school, whatever, let's get over it. But the idea is what? I'm the president. But we find that the lesson is what? He says, no, I'm not going to drink. Why? One of my rabbis used to say, Yeshiva learned in Torah Moshe, he used to say all the time, what? You've got to have a single-minded focus. For God. Single-minded focus. Figure out what is it that you want to do, and then nail that sucker. And only that sucker. You get involved in side things. What does the person say? I think I'll do this. I think I'll do that. Hey, I'll let him do this. That's when you don't know what to do. When you're focused, that's all it is. You eat, sleep, and breathe. Sega. Right? That's it. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, I got a Sega Genesis. That's what it was. It was like literally eat, sleep, Sega. That was the commercial. And that was my life. That was my life. Until <coughs> PlayStation came out. <laughs> and it is what that's what it's about, people. Just your whole focus. Yeah? When I was in high school, I'm a guitarist. What I think about all day. Girls. <laughs> but besides that guitar, right? No, of course. And there's one guitar. My whole day I'm thinking about guitar. I'm in this class guitar, that class guitar, that class guitar. The whole thing's my outside day. It's all focus, but that's what it is. Figure out what it is and start focusing. Scab a canary. And I'm a bubble okay. Strengthen yourself like a lion, because this is a challenge. Sometimes you chat it's a challenge. But when you go and you give it your all, that's when you're successful. And anything in life, in particular Judaism, is a person has that focus. I wake up in the morning, I'm not waking up, and Agav, I will then maybe on the way serve God. I'm waking up in order to go do my mission. So some would say, let me, let me ask you this, let, let, me, let me stir the pot a little bit. Let's say a person, let's say, is married. Are they supposed to give to their wife? How much percentage? Themselves should they give? 100%. 100? 
Okay, let's say they have children. Are they supposed to give towards their children? Hundred. <laughs> What's left of the hundred percent? Tell me, what is left of the hundred percent? So I guess just leave them, them, give them all. Good luck, kids. No <laughs> more less. How much is supposed to give to your kids? Hundred percent. Interesting. Okay, uh, let's say you work. How much is supposed to give towards your work? Let's say the hobby. How much is to give to your hobby? Did anyone notice an issue here? We don't, we don't have, have, we don't have 500 percent. Right? That's right. The cents are all taken up, especially with 2008 when everything fell. Right. So the cents are all taken up. What are we gonna do? These are Judaism. It's beautiful. You know how much you're supposed to give towards your wife and your kids and your husband, and your job, and your hobbies. I don't know how to answer that. I set up a question the way I don't want to answer it, so no, I'm sorry. But let me word it differently. Now, this is going to come out wrong. And I want it to. But then we'll fix it. What is the purpose of getting married? Children. What? Children. No. To do what? Yeah. To love and give love. Mm -hmm. To adore, till death do you want. Yeah. To do what you said, um, to serve God. Woo! A little religious, are we? <laughs> what is the purpose of having children? What's the purpose of your hobbies? What's your purpose of your work? What's the purpose of idolatry? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> not so dumb. Yeah. Okay, so what do we got, people? You know what the purpose of a spouse, of a child, of a neighbor, of a job, of a hobby is? This is going to sound a little bit painful for some of us. Others, it'll be right up our alley. The goal is to get as close as we can to God. And then we have pawns that we call spouses. No, God. They're not pawns. They're bishops. You know what? Let's call them queens. But you know what? If you play chess, you focus too much on your queen. Check me. You just lost. How many people, anybody, maybe you don't play chess, you know what I'm talking about. Does anybody ever play chess? Okay, so let's forget that. <laughs> let's talk about checkers. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't work with checkers. But the idea that we have so far is that when we focus too much, it's a, it ultimately, of course, it doesn't mean that you say to your spouse, honey, I'm just using you to get close to God, right? But ultimately, for one who understands clearly what they're doing here, the response to that would be, me too, honey. Me too. Yeah. Now, the best way of doing it is by actually focusing and giving towards them, right? Not just for the sake, but in other words, giving towards them. But ultimately, why have children? Why have a marriage with a wife? Why have, why have friends? Well, if you want to really appreciate what it means to connect with God, it has to start as a conduit of physical. The reality is we're physical beings. We're living in a physical world. So we have to elevate and take from the things in this world in order to learn from them and experience and grow with them. So therefore, what do we do? We take a spouse, we take a thing, but how could you understand what it means to love a thing you love? There's a mitzvah in the Torah, it's a commandment. The mitzvah is, you have to listen to you gotta love God. Ready, go. Love him. All y'all love him? All y'all love God? Now, a kid, if you say love God, he'll say, what does that mean? And you say, well, do you love your toys? He'll say, yes. Say it like that. Oh, I love God. But they don't appreciate what it means on the level of loving a spouse. They don't appreciate what it means on the level of loving a child, of a friend, which is why in the Pasuk, the after Lureacha Kamocha, love your neighbor like you love yourself. The word Lureacha means multiple things. It means your neighbor, it means your fellow. Numer Kedushin Daf Mem insinuates that it means a spouse. The Gemara in Shabbos Rashi points out Lureacha means God himself. You should love God like you love yourself. Why all these things? Because if you want to know how to love God, you've got to know how to love a neighbor, how to love a friend, how to love a spouse, how to love a child. That's when you start to raise your level of understanding what's going on. So it's 100% towards God. It doesn't mean you don't work. It doesn't mean you don't chill. It doesn't mean you don't play right and work hard and, and, and chill hard, right? And then relax hard, play hard, whatever they say, yeah? The concept is all these things, but it has to be the focus. And the only time we would follow focus is if either we didn't have a focus or Something derailed us, right? And we lost track of what's going on. And we gotta get ourselves back on. What is this? What about Jewish law? Shouldn't Jewish law start with do this, do that, do this, do that? Answer is 
right? Like any law book. You have your preamble, you have prerequisite, you have the beginning introduction. We the people, etc. But then we start. This law, that law, this law, that law. Why does it start a law book with strengthen yourself in the line to get up early in the morning to serve your creator? The answer is that's what everything's about. All these laws mean nothing if you don't have the proper focus. The proper focus is about understanding what we're we doing here. What's our purpose? What's our life's mission? What's our goal? And you know what's sad? You know they say there's a saying that if you know the origin, you love to hear it. That I forgot how it goes. You, uh, correct me. Youth is wasted on the young. young. Is that how it goes? Youth is wasted on the young? Right? So what ends up happening is, who says that? Old people, right? And then what do they say about themselves? Oh, and I'm too old. Right? Youth is wasted on the young, and I'm too old. So who does anything? I guess only between the ages of 30 and 42. You know what I'm saying? Because they're not youth, they're not old. I don't know, right? What, what, what's the idea of going on over there? Youth is wasted on the young, so the youth don't have to do it because they're like, what do I care? Pff, what do I do? The, pff, what do I do? <laughs> right now, it ends up with a cell phone, right? I don't have to do anything because I have my cell phone, right? And the old ones, what are they doing? The cell phone, right? <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. It's amazing to watch. I was, I was talking to someone, they got a phone call, and said, oh, excuse me, the guy's probably 75 years old, picks up a cell phone, and goes like this. <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, <laughs> That just doesn't look right. You know, there's something wrong with a 75 year old girl like this on a phone. Like, you know, it just doesn't, or anyone for that matter, but you get so caught up to do anything. People, if you're too young, so grow up. If you're too old, so then grow down. Right? Unless they're doing something about it. Change it. No, do I have to change? I don't know. What, do you have to change? Maybe you don't have to change anything. You probably do. But maybe you don't. <laughs> don't we all? And if we are doing something already, fantastic. Just take this as physics. Just take this as strength in what we're doing already. And start getting on with it. Discover the art. I'm a book of strength. Is like, why? 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 Because it's a fight of the will. Ezu Gibor, a Kovish is Yitzra, who's a strong person, someone who overcomes his Yitzra, his inclination. When you wake up in the morning, you have a battle. Not only wake up in the morning, every second you have a battle. And to go back two days ago, you've got to ask yourself, are you battling for the physical or for the emotional? Better. It's this kind of constant battle to the fore, to the rear, as Mr. Burrow as as Mr. Shum also brings down. So therefore, people, what do we got to do? We got to, we got to make sure that what when that alarm clock goes off, I like to move it, move it. You got to move. Get up and move. Some of us take it seriously. Thank you so much. I'm, so, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It is. Like, get up and move. But that's the point of what we got to do. People, so from the morning, wake up, get a strength or something. Say, okay, let's do a recap. We did one. There's one point that we did. So something we're going to say, what's comes to the book of Jewish law? Give all history with the Jewish law. in the first place. So the other Torah, the main Torah, the old Torah. Come down in Kansas, we'll chop on 150 hours. Skip all three years. I'm happy to do the rush around the river. Also, the round one day comes in. It's going to get scanned there from the way. After that, it comes. It's going to mix the brew. It's all under the round. I'll do the map. 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 I'll do so we gotta figure that out first. Is the Basil Sharm said about the judge first? We're gonna go inspire the same things. We're gonna go back to the We gotta figure out what is your goal. What is your mind? Single-minded focus only on that. Michael Phelps, or as I like to use John Havlicek. John Havlicek, Boston Celtics, 60s. He was number 17. The man scored 40 points with his left hand. He's right-handed as he broke his arm in the game. How did he do it? The answer is the guy, even though he's white. How did he do it? He was the first guy. He had consistency, continuity, pushing his goals to the limits. What he had in front of him, always understood where he was headed. And you understand where you're headed, you get there. People, understand the challenges? Yeah, that's why you scab you gotta, you gotta fight, you gotta be strong. You scab it to on the book of those boys, you know, shot. We even get into the next part of it. Maybe I'll enough to have a couple minutes. The wrong mother comes along and says, the father made yeah, and this is the I mentioned before the key to the key. This is the key. She visi Hashem and he saw me. We call God the Matur of Mount Sinai. Asher hochem nefnei Elohim. 
place the Lord before me always. I place the Lord before me always. Which means what? I have my goal right in front of me. A person like Michael Phelps, John Havlicek, pick any sport. Why a big sport? Because that's a clear example that you can see of people that push things. You can have a person that's involved in anything in life, in medicine, they push things also, the person involved in law, they push things, but you see it clear with the sport, right? So the person goes, hey, now they're going to push it, push it, push it some more, now what happens? What do they have in front of them at all times? Michael Phelps, what do you think he has in his house? Lots of medals, right? But besides those medals? Swimming pool. What? Swimming pool. Swimming pool, good. <laughs> right, wait. Healthy food. Healthy food. Can you imagine that he has any pictures of swimming in his house? In other words, can you imagine as a kid he had certain swimmers he looked up to? Can you imagine as a basketball player you have up on the wall basketball players and you have paraphernalia and you have all this stuff in front of you? Why? Because you love it so you keep it in front of you always. That keeps you focused. A person who in Judaism, it's not uncommon to walk into a, a boy who's studying in yeshiva and find them as walled pictures of great matters. Focus. There's a rabbi named Rabbi Gifta. A gifter became a, quite a quite a, a big scholar, and with gifter, he came from a, from a family where like, observant, but like a more you know um, Hebrew academy type day school thing, and he became one of the greats, one of the one of the big rabbis. Came from from I don't want to say nothing, but you get the idea. Coming from not a great rabbinical background, then he became right. a great rabbinical background, right? Or now, he had up on his wall pictures of rabbis, and there was one picture frame that was blank. And in it, it said, when are you going to be here? You got it? When am I going to reach my father's? And it's a constant in front of you. So peeps, step one. We spoke about yesterday. For who was yesterday, you got the, all the different steps of how to even do this. But now today, is let's figure it out. What, what's your goal? What should be your goal? Number two, single-minded focus to that goal and nothing else. Three, put a lot of paraphernalia to help you to continue in that mission. Any questions, comments, stories, or some facts, please keep them verbal and physical. Okay, people, it's been a pleasure. See you when I see you out there. Take care and have a great time with you.